You're listening to RN Breakfast with Geraldine Duke. Yes, lovely to have you company for breakfast. And, of course, you can hear us uh, across Australia on your radio, online, via the ABC Listen app on the digital free-to-air channel 26. And you've already been tweeting me ahead of our... We're going to devote quite a lot of time to our discussion about Australia's education challenges. So thank you very much indeed. And I'll try to put some of those uh, questions that you raise to our panel. Because education ministers will meet in Alice Springs next, next week for their final COAG meeting of the year. And it follows the release of the program Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, study earlier this week, which revealed an alarming decline in the performance of Australian students in maths, reading and science compared with certain other countries around the world. Here's Federal Education Minister Dan Tian speaking to breakfast. It's very disappointing and the uh, alarm bell should be ringing because we're not achieving to the best of our ability and we need to turn this around and we need to turn it around quickly and I'll be meeting with my state and territory education counterparts in Alice Springs next week. Uh, this will be the first item on the agenda uh, and all of us need to put our heads together be ambitious, refocus the agenda and make sure we start to turn around these results. And that's the Education Minister Dan Tien. The dismal results have ignited debate about equitable funding for schools and the stalled rollout of the so-called Gonski reforms. Sue Thompson is Deputy Chief Executive for Research at the Australian Council for Educational Research, ACER, which manages the PISA test in Australia. Mark Scott is Secretary of the New South Wales Department of Education and and Stephen Colber is a literacy improvement teacher at Brunswick Secondary College in Melcombe. Welcome to you all. Good morning. Thank Good you. Morning. Now, Sue, this was certainly on the face of it a pretty damning assessment of education in Australia. Do you see it like that? If so, why have we fallen behind? I do see it as that, but it's been some time coming. We've been declining in um, reading, maths and science basically since we started the assessment um, in 2000 and then maths in 2003 and science in 2006. So we have been declining that whole time. And I think the last, certainly the last three times that I've released the report, there's been similar, you know, news stories and wringing of hands, but, but um, nothing particular has been, I mean, there's been lots of initiatives, of course, maybe, but nothing particular has been done that's going to address uh, some of the major problems and one of which is the, the difference between advantage and disadvantage students within uh, the schooling system. And just a clarification from what I can read, reading hasn't declined, it's static. Is that right? It's the, it's the maths and science in particular that have gone down. No, back. reading has actually gone down as well. Oh, it has, has it? Yeah, it has. Everything, unfortunately, everything's declined significantly since, since the first um, point of, of measurement. So since 2000, we're looking at long-term um, slide rather than just between 2015 and 18. Right. So we're looking at it since 2000. It's declined by nearly one full school year level. And, Mark Scott, education spending, the irony is, has been rising over the last two decades, though the federal president of the Australian Education Unit, Karina Haythorpe, told the program earlier this week that the money's being spread unequally. Let's listen. In terms of funding going up, you have to look at where funding is going. What the OECD report clearly identifies is that we've got very big gaps between um, high uh, socioeconomic students and between students who live in disadvantaged backgrounds. We need to have a system which directs funding um, to those schools and students that need it most. And at this point, we don't have that system. We're moving to a different uh, level of inequality in this country, and it's something that we're very, very concerned about. Now, does she have a point there, Mark Scott? We are pushing towards needs-based funding. That's what the Gonski funding model's been about. And so most money that's been going in in the last few years has been focused on needs-based funding. But we've got to take the PISA results seriously, but they're a reflection of 10 years of schooling. And I think, you know, these problems, as Sue outlined, have been a long time in the making. And I don't think we can expect an immediate uh, fast turnaround. We're putting more money into disadvantaged schools. What's interesting in these last results, as I've looked at them, is that the bottom has not lifted the way we would have wanted mm. it to lift, but the top has fallen. Actually, it's the deterioration of the performance of the top students that I think is a hallmark of this PISA result, and also uh, 
disappointing and concerning and challenging for policymakers. Well, yes. Why? Well, uh, you know, I, I'd be interested in uh, Sue's view on this, but I think you've got to look at, well, what's happening in Australia? And I think there, there are two questions that come to my mind. What's the hallmark of our system? We know that literacy and numeracy is very important. We have a big focus on NAPLAN, but PISA is a far more demanding assessment than NAPLAN. I, I equate NAPLAN as like learning how to drive, getting the fundamentals. Can you reverse and park and accelerate but but uh, PISA is can you you know apply this apply it can you weave your driving across six lanes of traffic on a foggy day as the, the the rain is pouring down it's can you really apply that learning and that high level learning and I think there's a real critique here that says we're not demanding enough on of our most capable students we're not stretching them the curriculum doesn't demand that applied learning and deep thinking and certainly in New South Wales we're glad we've done a big curriculum review and this has been the diagnosis that our curriculum is not demanding and stretching enough students at the top end it doesn't focus enough on applied learning and doesn't expect higher order thinking and I think there's an argument that our expectations are too simplistic and aren't demanding enough. I'm, uh, this is, oh, I'm coming to Stephen in a moment but I noticed that Jennifer Hewitt writing in the Financial Review yesterday just made a, a little remark about um, uh, admission to university, sort of perverted scoring as she said where students are encouraged to take easier versions of subjects like maths in order to increase their chances of getting a higher grade. Yeah, and so there is the distortion that comes through the ATAR effect, but I think another really interesting question for us, I think one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years or so is that universities have opened their door to, to anyone really, very low ATARs to get into a range of courses, and prerequisites have largely gone from universities. So once upon a time, if you want to do a range of courses, you know, economics, engineering, sciences, you would have had to do maths. Well, relatively few universities demand maths as a prerequisite now, so more students are dropping out from doing maths at the higher level of schooling and, and in the last years of schooling, and I think there is this sense that more and more are viewing maths as a, an optional extra. And if you're not a maths person, if that's the way you've convinced yourself, then you avoid it. Well, these results in mathematics are very concerning as well, and this is where the most dramatic drop has been uh, seen this time, and that Australia is only at the OECD average on mathematics. Yes, well, I know, for the there, first time. There yeah. are policy questions that we're going to need to address. Now, Stephen Colbert, I, I think many listeners might be under the impression uh, that we solved the funding issue with the first Gonski report going back in, in, in 2011 that recommended a needs-based funding model. That's not actually what's been implemented, though, isn't it? I, if we went back to that model, in your view, would it make a difference? Uh, certainly wouldn't hurt. Um, I feel like I don't know. If from my from my view as a government school teacher, uh, the the issues are just the issues of society being acted out. So we can change the curriculum. We can do a whole ba a whole bunch of short sighted school based changes. Um, like for example, changing the curriculum. Uh, the PISA test is pretty much uh, curriculum doesn't affect it. Obviously, it's going to seventy nine countries. So. Um, you can't have it related to curriculum, otherwise one of the countries would do better based on the curriculum that they have. So I don't think that's the issue. I think it's a distribution of funding that needs to be addressed urgently um, at a societal level as well as an educational level, really. So it's a sort of a more systemic issue, but it's, that you think it does really quite vividly demonstrate priorities within the, in the society, do you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was up late, you know, Tuesday night until about 11 o'clock reading all the documents that came out of PISA, hearing the uh, media response as well. And I can't say there was that much that was surprising to me, to be honest. Um, you know, if I look at my class, increasingly there's massive gaps between the high achievers and the low achievers, between the low literacy students, the EAL students, those with a disability, those who are Indigenous. Um, and all of the graphs I was looking at just bared that out very strongly. And I think that what needs to be done is Teachers need less face-to-face -face time. I mean, that's one of the few things we are above the OECD average for. I don't think that's something we want to be claiming as a positive. Uh, and because of that, there's less time for intervention, less time to plan for those complicated students with really complicated needs and requirements. Mind you, they did also point to classroom behaviour, um, which earlier OECD reports said was especially bad in Australia. Uh, I was a bit surprised to read that. Oh, well, it's um, it's obviously PISA is, like I said, it needs to be almost culture neutral. So that's someone 
someone sitting somewhere else in rather than Australia deciding what good behaviour okay. is. We as Australians, I think we have a different view on what we want our students to be, a little bit more active, a little bit more, dare I say, you know, challenging at times than you might think of, you know, say your, your average opinion of uh, Asian culture and their view of teachers and their view of sort of what learning is and what it involves. Well, that's I think a, it's a very different thing. A very interesting segue because I noticed, Sue, with great interest that the 10 countries significantly higher than Australia were the, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, Jiangsu and Zhejiang, Singapore, Macau, Hong Kong, Estonia, Canada, Finland, Ireland, Korea and Poland. But mm -hmm. the countries not significantly different from Australian results were Sweden, New Zealand, the US, the UK, Japan, Taiwan, Denmark and Norway. So, I mean, what do we make of that? I thought we, we rather like being in that group, don't we? <laughs> well, we possibly do like being in that group in, that's for reading. Um, possibly that's fine being in that group, but I think being in the, in the um, also rands for mathematical literacy is, is probably more of a, more of a concern um, where, we're, where we're way behind um, countries, all of those Europe, um, Asian countries, but also behind countries like Ireland and United Kingdom and Finland and Denmark and Canada. So I think that's the main issue and and I think that um, I think there's a couple of points I'd like to make. One of them is that in terms of the extra funding I think that um, uh, there's a Grattan report out in um, earlier this year which looked at the funding and, and said that actually according to uh, when, once we adjust for the figures in, and adjust for the fact that our schooling uh, the number of students in schools is growing all the time once we adjust for wage growth and uh, an, an extra numbers basically of kids in schools there actually hasn't been a huge way, um, increase in funding to schools and actually 80% of that funding has gone to advantaged schools rather than disadvantaged schools. So the funding is certainly something that needs to be looked at and in both the recent TALIS report which looked at teaching and learning and the PISA report, there are huge gaps between advantage and disadvantaged schools and one of them that I think is really significant in terms of mathematical literacy is um, math teaching. We know that we have between a third and a half of mathematics teachers who are teaching out of field. They're not trained math teachers. They're not passionate about teaching math. They're not going to ha be able to mm. communicate properly Properly with students, they're not going to be able to scaffold weaker students or extend the higher achieving students. They're not going to be able to do those things. They're keeping their heads above water. They're often a couple of weeks ahead of the kids in terms of what they're what they're doing in the in the books. And it, it's just not ideal. We're shortchanging our country. We're shortchanging those kids by not giving them good teachers. Now, but Mark Scott, um, it's interesting that the only other um, country where maths performance has fallen further than Australia's is Finland, even though the country still outperforms Australia. And it goes back to that question of international comparison. I mean, Finland was the standout mm. star. Mm -hmm. Is there something happening in uh, significant parts of the West about... Uh, about educational attainment that is, is really quite troubling. Uh, I mean, it, it's interesting. Um, Adrian Pickley, um, who was long-time education minister here in New South Wales, I mean, I know he's been keen to prosecute an argument that says this is a family issue, this is a parental issue, this is a society issue. What is a hallmark of so many of those Asian countries that have done so well is that they yeah. take education seriously as a priority. It's a priority with a fam in a family. There's a big investment on doing well. I, I, I was interested at some of the response I heard on radio the day after these results came out, and it was a you know, talk back call of saying, look, as long as the kids are happy, uh, mm. why do we worry? Mm. And I think it's very easy in a country like Australia with almost 30 years of economic growth and a, a comfortable prosperity for many people to have a sense that does it really matter? Well, I think, you know, to extrapolate these trends the trend line we're seeing now and extrapolate that forward into the future. I think our young people face a, 
a greatly challenged future in a competitive international environment with all these countries doing that much better in education, which will be the foundation for life learning and life prosperity. Even if, as we know, and Stephen alluded to this, and certainly I've done quite a bit of coverage of this in other programs, there's a sense that a lot of the um, students in those countries doing well are enormously um, wound up. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 you know, they're very, they're sort of not encouraged to think in that sort of super creative, broad scale way that's challenging. That doesn't bother you? Well, I think, you know, clearly we want students to live balanced lives, and that's one of the things that we need to be uh, teaching them. But also we need to be prioritising that uh, there is a reward that comes from, from hard work and industry uh, in focusing on these important subject matters. And what's interesting, I think, on the evolution of PISA, I think, I think PISA is increasingly not testing rote learning and your ability to regurgitate back what you've learned. I mean, I think the achievements we're seeing in these countries, the ability to apply your knowledge in higher order thinking at a very sophisticated level and for them to be able to get all of their kids to that level, not just the socioeconomically advantaged, there's a lot in their learning outcomes that we would aspire to. We just need to be able to deliver that in an Australian context. I mean, see, Stephen, the OECD actually says spending more money doesn't necessarily improve results. It says the strongest performers tend to invest more in teachers by offering them higher salaries and greater professional status. Now, as a teacher, you'd want to hear that, I assume. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, if you read some of the reports coming out, you know, the Principal Health and Wellbeing Survey, um, principals are being attacked. Um, I can't really imagine uh, a culture that would happily say, you know, be, be the leader of a school and you might be attacked by parents. Um, and I think that's true for teachers as well. The level of respect we have in society uh, is quite low. I mean, I was surprised to be asked to even speak on this. I thought that was in and of itself something really quite surprising and uh, I'm impressed, to be honest. Did you? But there's issues there. And you yourself clearly feel you have to battle this. Yeah, absolutely. As I said, so I, you know, I finished a full day of teaching. Uh, I was sitting there at my school as the kind of as darkness fell as the cleaners came and vacuumed around us while we were meeting and trying to work out the complex problems that our students face uh then i rushed home to be there by seven o'clock so i could read the pisa study um because i figured that what would eventuate is what has eventuated which is you know uh teacher bashing in various forms whatever you want to call it you know there's not enough maths teachers we need more teacher quality i'm sure we'll be talking you know university entrant requirements pretty soon um, all of these things directly affect me personally and professionally. Do you want to stay in the profession? Absolutely. I'll be here for life. This is my profession, my career and my calling. Good. Lovely to hear. Now, I'm going to ask you all um, a, a, a question about whether uh, it's the... The digital revolution is having an impact as well. Parsi Salbert, the Professor of Education Policy at the Gonski Institute, um, says research shows a significant number of students today are distracted. I'm wondering, Mark Scott, whether this plays into exactly what you're talking about. And they're not ready to learn the complex skills and knowledge required in schools today. And, you know, too much device use, poor sleep, lack of physical activity also having an impact. Is this playing into the sort of... Um, the set of dilemmas that teachers have to deal with. There's no doubt it's added to the complexity and all around the country education systems are thinking through how you deal with devices in schools. Of course most of the distraction isn't coming during the school day but the time that these devices soak up once students are out of school. The, the, the challenge I think of that as, as a narrow hypothesis about the results is that these devices aren't only uh, available in Australia mm. and even all through Asia. I mean uh, teenagers have mobile phones and those mobile mobile phones have distracting apps on them so it's just another complication we need to deal with in helping students be in a sense disciplined enough and focused enough and have that growth mindset that's required to get them to focus on schoolwork and to have schoolwork engaging enough and interesting enough for them compared to the temptations of the devices and just quick offered. very quick final word to you sue yeah, I, I agree with Mark. I think that the, the Tim study has shown that many students in grade, both grade four and eight come to school tired and they're not really ready to, to, to work. And then so that comes back to parents making sure that their children are well rested and, and well fed when they come to school so that they can learn. 
and we haven't even discussed learning progressions versus set set uh, set curriculums and so on and so forth. Look, it's very interesting discussion. Thank you all very much. Stephen Colber uh, from Brunswick Secondary College in Melbourne, Sue Thompson from the Australian Council for Educational Research, and Mark Scott, Secretary of the New South Wales Department of Education. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And very Thanks. much welcome your uh, text uh, text feedback on uh, that particular discussion, which we must have a lot more of.